Again, welcome back to the AFC podcast. Uh, joined here by Coach Hammer, Coach Change League, and our, our special guest here out in the West Coast today. Uh, you know, these podcasts have continued to uh, to bring us uh, some some great content uh, from from a Canadian soccer standpoint. And you know, one of the goals that we definitely wanted to do in, in upcoming episodes was to talk to players from from the new wave um, of, of Canadian soccer. And we definitely have you know a, a great solid. Uh, professional here, you know, who's, who's paved the way uh, very well for himself uh, and, and is a great example, uh, you know, for, for, for Canadian uh, youth uh, all over. Um, starting off today's uh, podcast on a little bit of a somber note, um, you know, we, we'd like to extend our condolences to the Miller family. Uh, Gary Miller, uh, unfortunately, uh, passed away uh, this, this past week, who was uh, uh, the director of soccer operations here at Ontario Soccer. And, uh, you know, uh, without a doubt, was was somebody that wanted to push the game forward um, in, in in the direction for youth. And uh, you know, we hold our hats to uh, to Gary and, and hope that uh, you know we can all continue his his endeavor. Um, but on a lighter note, uh, I'd like to welcome our guest. Uh, needs no no introduction um, to, to himself. Uh, definitely one of my favorite players uh, on the Canadian scene. Uh, you know, in, in TFC. Definitely shared wonderful moments as well. Um, so this is a you know player that uh, is, is has been a, a, a very much on the forefront of, of Canadian soccer over over the last decade, and uh, you know we're we're glad to have him here today. Uh, to St. Ricketts, uh, thanks for joining us out there from uh, from sunny BC. Thanks for having me, guys, and thanks for the intro. Yeah, no, I I appreciate it, and. Uh, you know, we're, we're we're glad that you've taken some time off uh, with us uh, as well, just to catch up. You know, these these uh, podcasts have been an opportunity to catch up with players, just on a little bit more intimate, more you know, relaxed, switched off flow. Uh, so enjoy it, my friend. And uh, from from our standpoint, uh, you know, you came up in in Edmonton, Alberta, uh, which is a city that has a lot of love for the sport of, of football and and has produced some some gems, you know, for for Canada soccer without a doubt. Um, what was your soccer upbringing like, and you know who who is somebody maybe that you can take us back into your early years that you know really propelled your your, your development? Well, um, well, you know, back when I was when I was young, coming up in soccer, uh, it wasn't so popular in Edmonton. It wasn't the it was by far not even close to the main sport, and I didn't really have strong role models in the game, strong professionals that you know broke through those boundaries like like you guys had in Ontario with D. Rowe and, and uh, Julian de Guzman and Atiba Hutchinson and these guys to look up to. I never had that so much in, in uh, Edmonton. And I personally, I didn't know any professionals when I was younger. So um, I started kind of late. I started when I was 13 playing organized soccer. And, you know, things kind of went rapidly. From then I went to uh, sign for my first like club, not sign, but like my first club team, Juventus, and then um, after that, I got quickly U15 Alberta team, and then after that, um, Sean Fleming brought me into the national team. So it was kind of fast progression, but um, Sean Fleming was a player that kinda, the coach that kind of pushed me to the to get into the national team program and kind of showed me what I could do. Fantastic! And um, fast forward a little bit. Um, talk about your your college career. Um, you had a stellar career at University of Wisconsin, Green Bay. How would you yeah. sum up that experience? That's what it was. It was all new to me. You know, um, as a kid, my main goal was to get a scholarship following my brother's footsteps. Uh, he got a full scholarship to the University of Memphis. So that's, that was the limit for me. You know, I just wanted to get a scholarship, um, ease the burden on my family and just, you know, get a free education. And that's, that's kind of was my goal as a youth and then once I got to Green Bay I realized in my freshman year that I was one of the best players and you know I was I was doing well from my first year and um, I think that was the point when I realized that maybe I can make this into a career um, while I was at university I got called to the U20 team I was um, as well got called to the Olympic team and then I seen other players around the world doing things and I, I, I realized that this could probably become a professional coming career. So you, you took that opportunity. So from your college, you look to go beyond it, but 
I guess we can say now looking at it hindsight, you had a successful college and a pro career by all, on both accounts. So in regards to the college route, like how early on, I know you said your brother got one to the University of Memphis. So that kind of triggered it in your head, but how early on did you know that you wanted to attend Green Bay? And if that wasn't your first choice, what was, and why didn't you go to your first choice? What were some of the obstacles that may have come up and, uh, and if you can kind of expand on that part of your career? Yeah, I mean, um, once my brother got the scholarship, he's seven years older than me. So once he got a scholarship, I knew that this is what I want to do. You know, um, it wasn't easy. My parents weren't so involved in my extracurricular activities. You know, they were trying to run our restaurant and, you know, just provide the best life for us and make ends meet. You know, it was it was not an easy upbringing for me. So I was uh, very much on my own pursuing, you know, navigating these paths through soccer as a youth and I was fortunate to uh, run into a good friend and a uh, good family, uh, the Barkis family, who his mom reached out to universities, got coaches out to see us, and uh, the coach from uh, University of Green Bay, he's now the coach of University of Hartford, um, Tom Poitras, he came out to Edmonton to watch us play, and you know he, he liked us immediately, me and my friend, and he, he brought us in, so it was not like I had many options. I just took whatever options that came my way. I was, I didn't care where I went. I didn't care if it was in Green Bay or in Florida. I just wanted to get a scholarship and, and play soccer. You know, that's, that's, that was my only goal at that age. And uh, yeah, I was fortunate to have good people to help me along the way. Yeah, no doubt. You do need people that kind of help guide you and kind of put these opportunities in front of you. But is there any advice you can give to maybe our, our athletes and the, the, the younger players listening out there on that want to go that similar path through college to get to pro and not just jump ship straight from high school uh, into the pro game? Yeah, I mean, um, I get this question asked to me all the time in my academy and with, with the kids there. They're asking, should I, should I go to uh, an academy like Whitecaps or TFC or should I try to get a scholarship? And my answer is no, no two players are the same. You know, it, it depends on, it depends on your mentality. It depends on your character. It depends on your work ethic. If you want to go to a university, you got to make sure you're going there to kill it. You know, you're not going there to, to party and, you know, you know, chase girls and whatever it is you're going there with, with a focus on, you know, making it to the next level. And that's the same when you go to an academy like Whitecaps or TFC, you can go to these academies and not have the right mindset and just, you know, be lost in the crowd. And for me, it's all about character and it's all about mentality and whichever path you take it, I, I think you can become, become successful if you have those, those key components. You know, you can look at examples like uh, Kyle Lahren, he went to university, killed it. And now he's, you know, he's, he's in conversations with some of the biggest clubs in the world, signed the Besiktas, you know, there's no, there's no route that is, is guaranteed, but what you can guarantee is your mentality, your work ethic and your character to make it to the next level. And I think those are more important than which path you take. So I just want you to maybe take us to, 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 to the end of your, your career at, you know, uh, at Green Bay, uh, transitioning into Finland, going to, to MIPA. Um, how, how did that start to open up for you? Uh, if you could just reflect back on that. Um, well, after the U23 Olympic qualification process um, with Canada, uh, I did quite well in that tournament. I think it was, I scored three goals in five games. I, I can't quite remember, but I got hooked up with an agent after that, which was Courtney James, which you guys are familiar with. And um, from, from conversations with him, he made me realize that, you know, the, there are options in Europe. And this is where my new goals were at that point. So I was ready to take every opportunity, just like I did when I was, in, when I was looking for universities. And um, I went on trial. My first trial was in Sweden with Hammerby um, under Greg Berhalter and um, uh, Charlie Davies was there as well and he was leaving to go to the Olympics that they qualified for and Berhalter wanted to sign me for six months but I didn't want to just leave university at that time so I finished my remaining season at Green Bay and then I just went on trials and landed landed in uh in Finland so it wasn't an easy path, but I was willing to take risks and take every opportunity. And I, I really had no fear in which, which environment I would end up in. That's awesome. That's, that's really, you know, such a common theme in terms of, uh, you know, all the players that we talked to and they made the jump to Europe. It was, 
you can sort of not not looking sideways or not looking backwards, just just really looking ahead towards it and and you know getting both feet into the deep end. Now transitioning in, into you know from from North America to to Scandinavia, uh, you know I'm, I'm sure there's similarities, but there's there's also differences you know from the from the culture of life to the to the culture of sport. You know going from NCAA to now professional football. You know how did that go for you uh, overall? Um, what were some of the difficult difficulties and, 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 you know, some moments that maybe stand out in those early days for you? Um, well, yeah, it was obviously I was ecstatic to sign my, my, my first professional contract. Family was happy. I was, I was, I was very happy about it, but it was a big, big learning, learning experience for me. You know, I had to transition from that kind of youthful mentality that I was carrying through university where, you know, I was focused on soccer, but I was still kind of having fun. And, you know, I had to kind of just navigate the path of becoming a professional and, and what that entails, you know. So uh, Muipa was a very, a very good place for me. And I'm, I'm, I'm very appreciative of that, of that stop in my career. And uh, I learned a lot. I had a, I had a great coach who was willing to help me grow uh you know my character as well as my as my ability and it was in a, a place where i had the opportunity to play lots which i felt was important early in my professional career and um yeah you know i i, I made some mistakes you know i i but i learned from them and i i tried not to make the same mistakes twice and that was a place where i really grew into the uh proper professional and uh learned a lot of those the ways of becoming a professional so it was a good stop, and you know I'm I'm forever grateful for that for that club. Um, they actually no longer exist anymore. They, I'm not sure what happened if it was financial or just in terms of popularity or management, but they they no longer exist. So that was a good stop in my career, and uh, I learned a lot there. Fantastic, and I, and I love what you said about about the mistakes. You know, you made mistakes, you learn from them, and you try not to make those mistakes again. I think that's important for our younger players to hear. Um, in saying so, uh, you continued a successful career for the Canadian national team, being being part of probably our most talented teams we've ever fielded. Taking us back to your earliest times playing for Canada till now, what are some of the moments that stand out for you the most? Well, for sure, the the one moment that stands out was my first goal for Canada for the for the men's team. Um, it was at it was at BMO in Toronto. I think it was my third, maybe my second camp or third camp with the national team. And we had everyone there, you know, we had Dero there, we had Julian, Atiba, McKenna, Mike Lukowski. Uh, Ecuador, um, Ecuador, you guys Ante played? Yasik, we had everyone. Um, Lars Hirschfeld in net. And it was all players that once I started to really appreciate the game of soccer, I started looking up to these guys and, and you know, envisioning – playing with them. So once I got the opportunity, I was, I was, I, I grabbed it with both hands and I, I came in as a sub late in that game. And um, I remember it was a quick, quick free kick by Julian, uh, caught the Ecuador defense off guard. And I just took a touch and scored my first goal there. And it was just uh, a feeling that I'll, I'll never forget in front of my family, my friends in my, in the country I love. And uh, yeah, that was definitely a memorable moment. So along with your, your, your national uh, like exposure with the national program, like footballers throughout their career have many adventures and different experiences. You yourself, having played in the, the Finnish league, the Norwegian league, the Nor Romanian league, Israeli league, Turkish league, like to add up all those just alone, like the football culture, was it like vastly different between all of them? Was it significant in your, your case from the experiences between all of them? Was it similar? And, and if it was, like, how did you adjust so quickly to the differences from one to the other? Yeah, um, that was definitely a, a skill that I, I developed throughout my career, just being able to jump into new environments and, and feel comfortable quickly. You know, um, I, I, I really value character and I, I just tried to be the best I could be in those situations and being patient with people and understanding their difficulties and dealing with me so I can react in a better way towards things I experience, if that, if that makes sense. And every environment was much different, like going from Finland where 
you know, it's in Scandinavia and the, the average Finnish person knows a, a good amount of English to go into uh, Turkey where, you know, maybe two guys on your team speak English and the coaches do not speak any English. You know, it's like there were some tough environments, but um, it really molded my character and I, I developed some, some really good skills in, for example, just reading body language. I had to really develop that, just knowing how people were feeling without communicating with words. And um, yeah, every environment was different. Every environment posed their obstacles and adversities, but I think all those obstacles that I overcame and that I encountered made me the person who I am today. And that's why I, I feel like after my career, I would like to be a, a GM or someone in the front office who is in charge of creating that environment for players and um, really making it the best for them. Because I ran into situations where the environment was not so great. And I ran into situations where the environment was fantastic, but uh, I learned, I learned a lot in both situations. So um, every environment was different, but um, I found the value in each one. No, that's all life is about. It's about learning from experiences and stuff like that. I, I guess language barrier, like you said, going from fin Finland, where a lot of people knew English to Turkey or where a couple of players, like aside from language and learning body language and just the, the barrier of English to the, the, the native language of the league. Was there anything that you could specifically say that like maybe you really like a, a big challenge you kind of had to really overcome with each each move? Yeah, I mean... I, I, the biggest thing was just the reasons why I was moving and why I was switching clubs. And not, it wasn't like I was getting transferred from club to club. Like I had to, when I left Romania, I was, I was trapped, you know, like they held on to my ITC. I don't even think many players even know about their ITC, you know, it's your international transfer certificate. But I learned a lot about this stuff. I learned about contracts and what you need to have in your contract. So they can't trap you in those situations. And, you know, I, it was tough because there was a lot of moments where I could just, you know, just say, forget about this and just be, be ignorant and be, be angry and just, you know, kind of go against the grain. But, you know, I always try to remain professional in every situation. And even though some of these clubs weren't paying me on time and some clubs didn't even pay in the end, I still remained professional through to the end. And, um, you know, I just kept moving. And I think it's just, it just, uh, shows, uh, my resiliency and my, my, um, my work ethic to just get through these these moments and these are some things that you know you can't control uh, but you can only con you can control how you deal with them and that's how I seen it yeah for sure touching on the word uh you know resiliency I think that that's that's probably the, the main word that that sticks out to me you know when I when I when I talk to and and, and sharing the experiences of, of professional footballers you know that's that's really one word that sticks out you know, for having the opportunity to to travel these countries, um, you know, would definitely give somebody a, a, a different perspective on, on life. You know, what are what are some of the moments in, in your time in, in in Europe that have resonated with you as as a footballer uh, and, and as a person? And also, just to add a little bit towards that, if maybe you can touch on, uh, you know, what kind of role of you know your family played in in, in some of the you know consistent changes that you were going through in your life. Yeah, well, uh, so the second one first, my, my family was just my rock, you know, whenever these hard situations came, they're always there to say, keep going, you know, they never once said, why are you doing this? Just stop, try something else. They never once said that. They just said, keep going, keep working. And, you know, my mom is a, an example of that. And she, she really showed us as kids what hard work is and what it means to be resilient in hard situations. So I, I got a lot of that from her. But um yeah, being in these being in these environments, like you, you, for example, in Turkey, you see kids that are literally playing for their lives. You know, they're playing for their families so they can eat. You know, like it's it's a different type of drive that you see being in these environments where you know you go to training and when you're on the pitch, they're no longer your friends. You know, they're you're battling for positions, you're battling for your money, you're battling for your life and that's what I felt in some of these situations and you know it, it really changed my mentality of what hard work means and what drive means and um yeah being in some of these environments was I experienced some 
some crazy things, some crazy uh, stories and experiences. Um, for example, in Israel, um, my, my ex-teammate from Green Bay, when I was in university, he's an agent out there. And, you know, he was a good friend of mine. And we hung out on sometimes on weekends and after games and stuff. And we went to, we went to his wife's house. And his, her wife, his wife's brother was preparing to go to war. You know, and I, I get to his house and we have dinner. And he's just sitting on the, you know, he's sitting on the lazy boy, eating a bowl of cereal. And his mom's packing his bag to go to the border of Gaza to be on the front lines, you know. And it, it's just, it was just showing me how different life could be. And it made me appreciate Canada even more and, and what a great country it is, you know. And I just realized that, you know, nothing's for granted and everything takes hard work and you got to appreciate the life you have. It's amazing. So very amazing. Let's let's fast forward now a little bit to the time when you are in my city or <laughs> our city. Um, you had a very successful time in in, in Toronto. You always uh, will be loved and respected by the people in our city and the, the Toronto FC fans. What were moments that will never that will always stand out for you uh, with your time in Toronto? And what were some of your favorite things about our city? Well, first and foremost, i um, grateful for that organization as well. Um, you know, I was prior to coming to TFC, I was in Boluspor in Turkey and they hadn't paid me in three months and I was trying to break free out of there. So I ran into another unfortunate situation and I would say I was at probably one of the, one of the lowest points in my career in terms of mentality and running into my third club that's not paying on time i i simply went into the president's office to ask about my salary and if they're going to pay after being two months behind and he he sent me to train with the under 16 team or under 18 team kids you know and we we're training in the snow in turkey and you know it was it was definitely a point where i i just i felt like i needed to come home and toronto Toronto FC opened their doors to me. You know, they gave me an opportunity and they helped fight for my, um, for my certificate, my transfer certificate, and they got me free out of, uh, out of Boluspor. You know, it took some time. I arrived in Toronto in April and I was training with TFC2 the whole time until my, my ITC got released and I didn't start, I didn't play my first game until August. So it was, it was definitely a, a, a tough moment, but forever grateful that they, they helped me through that. And some of my favorite moments in Toronto, there's so many. Um, that was, it was a great, great team, great team of 2016, 17, 18. And um, yeah, just winning, winning the MLS Cup, you know, just coming shy of it the year before, losing in that manner. You know, they didn't have one shot on goal and we still lost. It was, it was tough, but just that 2017 year and just seeing the drive of all these players like Michael Bradley, Josie, Victor Vasquez, and just Javinko, just seeing the drive. We were winning games and we were already looking to the next one, you know, like we, it was just clicking for us. And it was, I, I, I felt what a true champion team, championship team feels like. And, and that year will, will forever be one of the, one of my, my greatest football years. And, and Toronto C is, is forever, forever in my heart. Nice. Now let's try to get right into the present. Uh, You've obviously had a very successful season back in Europe and returned to Vancouver where your impact and leadership was almost, was pretty much immediate. Um, you're an integral part of your team and off the pitch, you're also completing school commitments, working towards a degree in, uh, I believe, sports management. Um, what are some tips or examples you've harnessed in, in your mindset to enter your veteran years with an elite approach, both on and off the field? Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's my 11th professional season, or I think around there. Um, but yeah, just, just being that voice, you know, I, I had it so many times in my career playing with the national team under, you know, with, with, with great players, and, you know, they helped me so much. So I just want to reciprocate that and with my group of players and my team and really be that, that leader within the group to help these young players, these young Canadian players understand what it takes to be a true professional and what it takes to be successful, you know? Um, having, having won a championship in MLS and seeing what it feels like and what the environment 
feels like and what the team spirit is like. I just want to bring that to this environment and really show the players what it takes, you know, and uh, it's a, it's a role that I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be in um, on the pitch and off the pitch. And yeah, like you mentioned, I'm, I'm also pursuing my, my, my sports management masters and, um, you know, really trying to do what I can now, but also prepare myself for the future as well. And I think both are very important. And um, I think all kids, all, especially in the MLS where they, where they provide the university and provide all the, all the options to, you know, finish your school and, and, and pursue something for post career. I think it's, I think it's a great opportunity and it was an opportunity that I took and then, and, and um, it's something that I want to do in the future, you know, manage a team, be a GM. That's amazing, Toss. And, you know, when I, when I look back, uh, you know, just for you coming into to Vancouver, uh, you know, one, one of the things that I, I told court was, you know, this guy is, is playing, is walking, is talking like he, you know, he really gets life right now, you know, and that's it's just kudos to you and, and the mindset that you put in uh, towards it. Um, overall, again, you've chiseled out a very successful career for yourself and, and you're a great example, you, you know, to Canadian footballers. You've been cultured in, in the pathway of NCAA, uh, the road to Europe, and, and also MLS. You know, these, these pathway decisions now, they start to open up a little bit more and more uh, for, for a top young talent. You know, there's always sort of that Euro route where, where people are sold, you know, from a very, you know, early uh, age as, as a pinnacle. Um, you know, looking back at, at your career and maybe, you know, if you fast forward as, as a player sort of coming out in, in these stages of the game now, you know, would, would you say uh, you would value Europe over MLS uh, um, and, and, and any, any above the other? Uh, in terms of a pathway based off of your experiences? Um, no, no, I wouldn't. I've seen players go to Europe and and um, not do well, you know, and have to come back. You know, there's no guarantee if you go to Europe, you're going to make it. And there's no guarantee you're going to make it in MLS either. You know, um, both environments are tough. And like I touched on before, uh, it's it's a mentality thing. You got you to gotta be going into these environments knowing that you got to work every single day you know it's not gonna nothing's gonna come easy you know and I, I think that's the misconception that oh you think you sign to a team or a team brings you in that that that's the end of it you know you made it but that's your that's just where the work begins and um, that's where the pressure begins as well and you have to be willing to do both and handle both and um, Europe is a great option and MLS is a league that is is, is growing every year and you know it's it's a it's a lead that North American players can feel more in their comfort zone as well. So it's it depends on the person, it depends on the player, and it, it depends on the mentality. You know, um, I can't say. Obviously, if you get a big club like Bayern Munich, like Alfonso Davies, you 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 run on it. You know, you you jump at it. But um, you know, I just think that players should be willing to take any option that comes their way and be fearless and know that there's going to be sacrifices along the way and you have to be willing to take them. That's amazing. It's amazing. And I love to hear you, you talk about that sacrifices. You just, you just take it, you know, it's fantastic. Um, Toss, let's have some fun now. You know, we mm. kind of diverge into some, in some really cool experiences with you, but let's, let's get to have a little fun. We call this session now rapid fire. So I'm going to ask you a series of questions and you, you answer it to the best of your ability. All right. What was your most fond memory of a loss in your career? Fond memory of a loss? Yeah, guy. Is there such thing? Of course there is. I know, I know what it is. If you, I think you were part of that team. I don't know if fond right. memory. <laughs> Which team? The national team. <laughs> I know it's not fun, but it's oh, fun. that's I, I honestly that is in a deep corner of my mind that if, if we're talking about the same situation, that's like a stain. That's like <laughs> oh god, sorry. yeah. I mean that that is not definitely not a fond memory, but it's a memory that was tough. Was tough, you know. Um, big expectations going into Honduras and a uh, good team, very good team, and an opportunity to make it to the to the hex. And yeah, didn't go as we planned. We lost that game in Honduras. Um, but I mean, looking back at it now, there was there was experiences to gain through there, and 
Um, from that point in that game, I feel like I can step, I could step into any environment and, and not feel shook or feel the pressure of the, of the stadium, of the fans or mm-hmm. of the weather or um, just that, that was the most hostile environment that I, I, could, I ever been in. And yeah, it, it prepared me for the rest of my career. Good. So having said that, what was your most fond memory of a win? Um, there's, there's, a, there's a few. I would, say, I would say the win, I was in Turkey, second division Turkey, mm-hmm. uh, with Buja Spor, mm-hmm. and we were progressing in the cup, and then we, we met our, our next opponent, which was Besiktas, against Atiba Hutchinson, and I, was, I, was, I had a little knock leading up to the game, so I was kind of upset. I wasn't sure if I was going to play or not. And the coach said, you know, I'm going to bring you in. I'm going to bring you in after half. And, you know, you'll just play the rest of the game or however it was. And we were, we were tied 1-1. And then I came in and, and made a run from half. And Atiba was chasing me behind. And it was just <laughs> – I scored a banger. And it was just – the stadium erupted. I think there was like 80,000 people there and mostly Besiktas fans. But it was, it, was a, it was a win that I'll never forget. Fantastic. Definitely. Um, who is the top player you've played with in your career? Top player I've played with? Yeah, one player. One player. Mm, I'm going to say Atiba, Atiba Hutchinson. Just nice. his consistency throughout his career is I've, like nothing I've ever seen. Um, I've never seen him have an off day. He's, he's been consistent his, throughout his whole career. He's played in great clubs. He's a great example of, of character, hard work, sacrifice. And he, he's somebody that um, I look up to in the, in the game of soccer. Tiba. Angie, for the record, that's one more for Brampton, okay? <laughs> yeah. Woohoo, Brampton. Stand up. <laughs> <laughs> um, having said that, who is the greatest leader you've played with in your career? Someone who, took, someone who took you under, under their wing and, you know, kind of showed you the ropes and someone you looked up to. Greatest leader is, is hands down Julian de Guzman. Uh, he, was, he was a veteran when I came into the national team and somebody that I looked to for advice. I could ask him anything, you know, whether it's, you know, outside of soccer, inside of soccer, about family, business, about anything, you know, he, he always had a, uh, a solid answer for me and he's somebody that helped me overcome a lot of these adversities and obstacles that I was experiencing and and, and kept me level-headed through the process and he's he's uh somebody that I mentored through through my career and somebody I'm, I'm very good friends with and still look up to to this day nice and tell me what what is the proudest moment that you've ever experienced whether that be for your club or your country uh proudest moment Oh, there's, there's, there's been a few, um, I would say proudest moment would probably be just winning that championship. You know, um, it's, it's championships are hard to come by, you mm-hmm. know, you come, you can come short a lot of times and, you know, it's, it's something that a lot of players don't get to experience. And I got to experience that in Canada mm-hmm. with Toronto FC in front of my friends, in front of my family and, you know, my, my girlfriend. And it's, it was a very proud moment to, to, Win that, win that championship and, and something that, you know, I can carry with me for the rest of my life. So, which leads us to your top 11. So, oh, you're going to... Top 11? Your top 11. Of that guys I played with? You played with. So, you got to name yourself on that top 11. And I'm going to give you okay. an olive branch of three subs. <laughs> <laughs> so, I need a pen and paper. Okay. Um... Top goalkeeper I played with, Azmir Begovic. Uh, we played together as youth. We, he, he, um, I think he immigra- his family immigrated to Edmonton when he was young. We grew up playing when I was 14, 15 with Alberta and uh, early days with the national team. So Azmir Begovic would be my goalkeeper. Mm-hmm. Uh, right back. Oh, man, this is tough. Right back. Cool. Okay, left back, I'm going to go with Mike Klukowski. 
Nice. Just because he was, he was just so unpredictable and his left foot was amazing. And, um, you know, he was in some of those environments too. And, and he helped me, you know, navigate through Turkey and those of those environments. So he's definitely, he's definitely one of my defenders right back. Right back's a tough one, you know. All right, we'll skip the right back and come back there. Tell me, tell me some center backs. Center back, Kevin McKenna. He was a good leader. You know, he had that strong German mentality, and he really solidified things back there. Um, Chris Mavinga would be my other center back because he's just, you know, pacey, he's fast, athletic, and he's just a problem to deal with. Uh, in my midfield, I'd probably play with two defensive midfields. I would throw Michael Bradley in there and mm -hmm. two, Michael Bradley. And Julian de Guzman. Mm -hmm. And then I would be up top with um, Josie Altador. Mm -hmm. And so what do I need now? So you have two in the midfield right now, I think, right? Julian and Mike. Right back, you need an attacking mid. and you Attacking mid would be... Definitely Sebastian Javinko. Mm -hmm. He'd be my attacking mid. And my right back. You know, right back's an interesting one. I, I can't think of... You know what? My right back would be... Aro. Aro. Brazilian. Just because he has that Brazilian flair and, you know, he can, he can get up and down the line. He's, he's tricky. He's a dribbler and... You know, he's just a cool guy, and you have to have at least one Brazilian in your team, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, that's <laughs> tough, though. You, you need to give me time in that because, like, <laughs> you need one more up top, though. Well, I'm, yeah, just, I'm just spinning it out there, huh? That's just it. You need one more up top. You need one more up top. You and Josie, and one you more. You and Josie, yeah. I said Javinko, no? Javinko is your attacking midfielder? Attacking number 10, yeah. So you got, you got four, three, two right now. Yeah, you need one yeah. more. You need one more up top. So, actually, you know what? I would do it like this. Me in the middle, or Josie in the middle, me on one side, Seb on the other side, and I'd, and I'd slot in the Tiba at the tack in midfield. There you go. Okay. Yeah, there you go. There you go. There you go. That's a good team toss. That's not bad, huh? That's a good yeah, team. Yeah, all of these teams. That's not bad. I, I was about to say after after the words from Matibo, you were gonna leave him off for your love and that was it. No, 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 no. I knew there's there's one more spot there. One more spot and, there. And, and, and we and we have to we have to you know we have to big up Brampton too, right? Brampton's gotta go. Yeah. Yeah. Always, always. Awesome. Well, Toss, you know, I, I think I'm just gonna add one more question. You know, you you've just been just so insightful in, in our in our conversation. You know, we always say, uh, you know, from from a Canadian standpoint that it's critical to get, you know, players like you um, and, and players that have had these experiences eventually into management and eventually into, into these situations. Now, I know, you know, you're, you're still a ways away from, from going into that cycle and, and, you know, more continued legacy towards you. Uh, but, you know, aside from, you know, some of the camps that you started to run successfully back home in Edmonton, um, you know, is, is there a specific type of management that, you, that you'd like to get into? Um, is, is it more from a governance standpoint? Is it more from an everyday club standpoint? Is there something that interests you along those lines? Have you begun to envision it? Yeah, definitely. I, I, I want to I be, be head GM. You know, that's, that's my goal. I want to be, be the guy that's in charge of the decisions that affect the players and affect the environment not only on the soccer standpoint, but also in the business standpoint. You know, I want to be able to align with the demographic of my city and, and generate, help generate that fan base that, that really loves the sport and really loves the team, you know, and, and, and really, um, really nail those points. And as well as uh, seeking out sponsorships and, you know, and, and, and partnering with the right, right investors that really highlight what my club will be about and, yeah, it's just, it's something that I envision and something that I, I'm working towards and, and, you know, I'm, I'm learning a lot and I just want to, I have a, a big passion for business and a big passion for soccer. And I, I feel like being a GM takes the, you know, you can take advantage of both those, both those components and, and make something beautiful. 
Yeah, well, more power to you, Toss. It's, it's, been, it's been great to catch up with you. I think, you know, uh, overall, uh, you know, your career has is, is, is been a great spectrum that, that is going to give you insight in towards, you know, that next chapter. But, uh, you know, there's still a lot to write uh, in, in this chapter for you. Uh, unfortunately, through this, uh, through these times uh, with COVID, uh, I, I think, you know, especially for you, you were, you were cut off at a very good point. You know, you started off uh, the season very well uh, for Vancouver, but, you know, ultimately it's, it's great to see for, you know, all the professionalism and, and all, high, all the high, high character and hard work that you've put in uh, into your career that you've ended up in a place that seems like it's a very good fit for you um, and that your value is, is, is going uh, to, where, to, where, to where we all know it should be. So continued success to you, Toss. Uh, you know, we, we look forward to uh, seeing you back on the pitch. Uh, obviously not scoring against TFC, but uh, uh, we, we definitely look for... I'm, wait, I'm, wait, I'm waiting for there. that moment. I'm <laughs> waiting to go back. <laughs> uh, no doubt, man. Listen, you score, drinks on you. Uh, a drink on, a round on you. If, if you don't, uh, a round on us. But uh, <laughs> uh, for, for, from that standpoint, uh, you know, we wish you... Uh, all the best on, on, on your return to play and, uh, you know, to continue to, to write that chapter for us in, in, in Canadian soccer as well as it's, it's, you know, it's going very well for us as well. Thank you. Thank you guys. It was a good chat. Thanks, Toss. Awesome, guys. All right, later. Thanks.